G'day and welcome to the Noob Spiro podcast, the show where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from all around the world. To become a better Spiro, come and join our spearfishing community at noobspiro.com. I wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water, and that's why I started spearfishing. I just clamped down on the reel and got drugged down to about 50 feet, and I'd never had a battle like that before in my life. But when you're learning where to hunt and find fish, they're the hot spots. It's where fish want to be. Don't overcomplicate your gear. Don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started off in stubbies with a bloody belt with a pig knife on it. And I've seen this big fin break the surface, roll into the water, look down, here's this nice big Great oh. Once your face hits the water and you feel relaxed and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear. It's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Adreno is one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. You can visit Adreno online at spearfishing.com.au or in store at their Brisbane or Sydney locations. G'day Noob Spiro community, welcome to the show today. Today we've got a long-time listener and fan, Pete Morris, uh, with us. He's a rock-hopping veteran. He's been spearing six years, even though he's only 16 years old. He, um, he's he been following us for a while, and he, he re- re- regularly uses the hashtag Noob Spear on Instagram. So thanks for which, that, Pete. Which everybody should be using. Everyone. everyone Absolutely. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and um, so welcome to the show, Pete. Uh, thanks, guys, for having me. Oh, no worries. Right, hey. So, uh, Pete, you're 16. Where, where are you diving, mate? Why don't you tell us where you're diving and, and sort of how you got started? Um, I'm just diving off uh, just the beach down the road from where I live. Um, I've been diving there for most of my diving career. I live down the road from the beach. Yep. So nice and close. Um, so what part of the world are you from, Pete? What town are um, you I'm from uh, New South Wales, um, along the south coast. Yep. Cool. Um, place called Bulleye. Bulleye. Bulleye, there you go. Cool. Um, yeah, so I've been spearfishing for um, six years. Yep. And uh, so what sort of fish are you sort of encountering along there, Pete? We get basically everything besides your Big, big pelagics. Um, so you're getting your – just your flatty, your leather jacket, moeys, um, squid, craze, um, bastard trumpeter, um, your jewies and your kings. Yeah, awesome. Sounds like a lot of variety. What, what, um, what's the sort of the bottom composition like down there? Are you getting weed and sort of rocky headlands? Uh, you- yeah, it's – a bit weedy where you just jump in and you can just swim out to the back of the furthest rock and then you have your drop off. Cool. So that, that's where all your kings and all that will come in. Okay, so your you bottom, you've got a fair bit of variety by the sounds of it and you've talked a little bit about what species, what are some of the um, common sort of obstacles you've had getting started spearfishing? Um, common obstacles would have had to be um, not knowing many people when I first started that did the sport. Yep. It's only in the last three years I've actually gone and, like, dived with new people. Yep. Uh, another obstacle would have had to be... Sorry, Pete, just take you back a step. So you had trouble meeting other Spiros and getting to go out with them and that. Um, how did you overcome that? Um, a thing called Facebook. Um, <laughs> yeah, so just talking to people um, and the people who I did know, um, just talking to them and um, seeing who they dive with um, and basically going on from there. Cool. And so now that you've sort of got a wider pool of dive buddies, has that accelerated your development? By heaps, yeah. Awesome. That's awesome. Good to hear a successful story. Um Particularly, you know, as a young bloke starting out. It's something I didn't do. Yeah, me I, I sort of did it the hard way, head against a wall. I went out by myself every weekend, you know, mm. dumb things, unsafe, and it's slow learning. And yeah. I'm a slow learner to start with. Yeah. So it was slow <laughs> by slow. So, yeah, mate. So, yeah, definitely if I'd uh, 
This is how much of a technotard I am. I didn't even think I had Facebook when I started. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 yeah, he's 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 approaching forty though, Pete. So you know, like I'm thirty one, and not only that, I do all the sound and technical stuff for this show. So <laughs> oh, thank you, I've really improved. <laughs> oh, he's very good. He's a gifted guy. Um, all right, Pete, that's a really good obstacle and sort of how you overcome it. And, and you talked a bit about the benefits of finding, you know, like a community of Spiros and, and how that can help you with your development. Um, I guess moving on, what what would be, you know, could you share with us the story of uh, uh, maybe your first memorable fish that you speared? Um, my first memorable fish would have had to be a 2.4 kilo snapper. Ooh. Yeah, still haven't got one. That's a nice. That's <laughs> yeah. a nice fish, Pete. Leading up to the day, um, the viz was about fourteen meters. Yep. So pretty good, um, especially for the south coast. And for hunting um, a snapper too. Yeah, the water was dead flat, so that was really nice. Um, no swell, pretty much. I've gone out. Um, just had a few kingy frames put them out and then put tenor out yep. and then okay. left that for half an hour i've gone gone back just peeked over the ledge and i've seen this um snapper and um i must have just eaten what i've put out and just had a little sleep <laughs> um <laughs> so i just got my gun and aimed and shot wow. um stoned it so I was pretty happy with that. So you put a sleeping fish to, to proper sleep, I guess. Uh, yeah. That's how Shrek shoots most of his fish, actually. Yeah, so not- you and him could get along <laughs> pretty well. But he's still... What's the time? You haven't shot a snapper, have you? Yeah, a couple. Just li- little squire, not not a snapper. Yeah, so it's a squire, not a snapper, like technically. I know they're the same species, but you're still... You're only in your squire... Like, yeah, so I'm definitely a you've got squire. Your squire badge, yeah. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the squire scout badge, and that's <laughs> it. Yep, Pete's one up on me. All right, Pete. So that's pretty cool. So you've actually you actually talked about a hunting technique there too, which was you, you laid down some burley, some kingfish frames, and then you've sort of stirred that up, and then you've you've gone away from that burley and come back to reinvestigate. I think they call that some people call that ghosting the burley or something like that. Um, but that's a really cool one. They use that in New Zealand a lot. Does that is that something that works for you guys down there a lot? Me personally, yeah, it does. Um, I'm not really sure about other people, yep. um, because when I go for snapper, I like to go alone, because a lot of my a lot of people I go with are like really noisy and they tend to scare off the fish. Yeah, yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, I got one. Oh, hang on, did you just take me to that? <laughs> no. Uh. We're putting ankle weights on his fins, mate, so he doesn't slap the surface anymore. <laughs> he didn't even come on a mile away. Anyway, let's go. So that, that's your most memorable fish. That was pretty cool, mate. What about, uh, I heard you speaking to Shrek earlier, mate. Why don't you run us through, and I'll come back to hunting technique, but why don't you run us through your scariest moment? Oh, uh, scariest moment um, definitely would have had to be um, when I was starting out and I didn't really know much about the sport. Um, all I knew was you get this big sharp thing and you uh, poke fish with it. Um, <laughs> um, it's essentially, yeah. We try to make yeah. it sound more complicated than it is, but that's what it boils uh, yeah. down to. Yeah, so I've gone from a dive. I've come back in, um, and as I've come back in, I've put, I had a hand spear at the time. I put the hand spear on the rocks, but the prongs were facing me. Oh, no. So <laughs> I've got up on the rocks, slippery as hell. Um, then a wave decides to come in. Oh, no. So, so I slip and three prongs go into my leg. Oh, I no. shouldn't laugh, but it's such a rocky mistake. It's funny. Um, <laughs> But the funny thing was that they couldn't fit me in the amb- ambulance because the hand speed was so old that corroded, so you couldn't get the head off. Oh, no. Um, oh, no. So we were working on um, a new surf club, club at the time, so they got one of the guys to get the angle grinder and grind <laughs> most of the spear off. Um 
Yeah. Oh, it's wow. A, it was pretty exciting. That's a rough <laughs> experience, man. Um, Imagine it was. So what? what <laughs> so, um, so you, you you went to hospital after the guy angle grinded it off, and um, did you did, did it get infected or was it all all right, Pete? I only spent oh, three or four hours in the hospital. Yep. So what did you what did you learn from the experience? Don't face pointy things where you want to uh, be when you get up. Yeah, it's a, it's um, very cool. Don't run with scissors. Don't point pole spears at your butt. Yeah. That's pretty straightforward. Holy shit, mate. I reckon three prongs. Hey, I've got to ask, when they got him out, man, did was it like um, seriously that must have made a mess, like getting the barbs out? Funnily enough, it, because I'm a big bloke, um, Shrek, you can relate. I can definitely relate to that. Good on you, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a couple of mils, so it was only in the fat okay. of my leg, so I, I wasn't bleeding I, I or anything. I can't relate to that, mate. I'm more muscle. <laughs> <laughs> that day, I probably had like three green whistles. <laughs> <laughs> I was off my head. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, so I went from straight from my local dive spot to a hospital. Um, I got rushed in to the kids' ward in this little room where they take um, blood samples from. So they've got the gas. They've gassed me up on top of the green whistles and um, then started doing surgery wow. on my leg. That's tough. <laughs> okay, so takeaways from that was obviously <laughs> be careful where you lay your pole spear and, you know, you got to be aware of swell and all the rest of it. And it's not like we're, we're not without pointy things we've got. Some guys carry two or three dive knives and you've got a spear gun and you were carrying a hand spear as well. So there's a few things there. And I think, you know, even though it is probably, you know, what you'd consider a rookie mistake, it's probably something that a lot of guys starting out um, aren't aware of. So good on you for sharing that story, Pete. Yeah, and what I've taken away from that would probably have to be guys with guns just buy like three centimetres of rubber band rubber the ones that you use for your gun, oh, and nice. just stick that on the end of the tip yeah, nice. of the shaft. Yeah, I do that every now and then when I change the rubbers. I just cut them up and so that, yeah, about, you know, two inches long, and then you've got them over the end of your spears when you're moving around. That's great advice. Good bit stuff. Of, bit of rubber on your shaft. It'll it'll yeah. protect you definitely. So um, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. All right, uh, Veterans Vault, it's that time. Veteran, Veterans Vault, Pete, we wanted to chat with you all about rock hopping. We've recently done a 101 on shore diving, so it'd be really good to cover some cover some ground again. So you wanted to talk about some of the dangers and what you've learned rock hopping. And I guess we've already talked about the hand spear and the leg incident. Um, what, what's, what's some of the other biggest hazards you've encountered uh, rock hopping? Probably big swirl and tides. Um, don't go rock hopping when it's like five foot swell and like two meter waves. They don't mix well together. Okay. And especially for like a person that's just starting out, doesn't know the area very well. You're just asking for an incident. All right. So what, what's some of the hazards with big swell and big tides? Um, you, yeah. So, so swell, obviously you've got. It's hard to get out, and it's hard to get back onto the beach. Um, what's some of the other hazards with tides? Knowing your tides um, is like really helpful. So, and plus, it you can use it as an advantage. So, when at highest point of tides is, it's going to be really easy to get in. But if you're going out on the lowest um, of the tide. It's going to be pretty hard, especially if you have, like, big rock platforms to hop down and then enter the water. Okay, so – and the waves stand up a little bit more too when the tide's headed out. And obviously, do you, do you deal with a bit of current when you've got um, big tides there as well? No, not really where I am. Um, 
We re- the reason I asked, we recently interviewed a guy and he was talking about diving in a sort of a tidal inlet and um, all of a sudden the tide changed and um, it just started racing out and he, you know, he nearly got hauled out through a narrow gap. And so I just thought you might be encountering some, um, some current issues with your tides. So big swell, avoid that, avoid big tides. Um, what's some of the other things you've learned shore diving? Always have a buddy. Going back to the Hansby incident, I didn't have anyone. The only reason um, I got to shore is because when I was going out, two other guys were going out as well. One of my mates that were surfing um, was just coming in and he said, um, are you all right? And I said, no, nah, I got um, hand spear in my leg. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, I'll just go get the lifeguard for you. So oh, wow. they dragged me from where I was on the rocks to the sand, which yep. was only like 15 metres. Yep. I, I could have, like, crawled there, but... <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, I wouldn't you like had a to, spear in your leg, mate. It's I, forgivable. I wouldn't like to drag Shrek fifteen meters. I don't care, even if it's downhill. I still don't reckon I could do it. I wouldn't want him coming anywhere near me with a spear in me. I'd give you mouth to mouth. You know, yeah, you I know you would. <laughs> You'd eagerly anticipate it. I think. Kisses. Right. Okay, so lucky those guys come along to your rescue, and you've said you know that's one of the benefits of having a buddy. Um, we just, I just wanted to touch just quickly on entry and exit points as well. You, you, you talked about that before the show, Pete. What have you learned about entry and exit points? Well, especially if you are more experienced and you're going out on pretty, well, I would say, sketchy days, um, knowing before you jump in, um, have an entry and exit point. So if the wave and swirl picks up even more and you need to get in quickly, um, just to have somewhere to get out of is um, pretty Helpful thing to have planned yeah, for. Helpful yeah, helpful thing. Yeah, okay. All right, so when you're planning an entry point, what do you look for on a, on a surf beach? If it's high tide, um, probably the shallowest part of the rock platform. So where I dive, we have like two massive rocks and like a little ditch, you would call it. Yep. And there's like kind of stairs into it. Okay. So you can just walk down and just chuck your gear in there. And yep. um, and for exit points, we have like, so our reef is like a big shark's fin. Okay. Um, so you can just swim around it. And then you have two beaches off side. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, so it's really easy to, to go in around. from there. Cool. All right. Sweet, Pete. That was um, really good. All right, what's in your dive bag, Pete? Head to toe, what equipment are you wearing right now in day-to-day rock hopping? Um, okay, uh, fins. I'm wearing fiberglass composites, Speedmaster. Yep. Um, they're the blades. Um, the foot pockets um, are Mares. Uh, yeah, love them. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, mask, um, a sonar platinum low volume tem- tempered glass. Yep. Reason I use tempered uh, glass, not the plastic lens, is because when you first buy it, there's this seal over it, and you can just burn it. The tempered glass, um, unlike the plastic one. Okay. Um. So yeah, you just burn off the layer, um, that's on there, and it won't fog up. Yeah, cool. I've seen a really good um Adreno gear tutorial video with that i might link that up in the show notes just because that is a common issue guys have is that mask fogging so i'll link that up in the show notes so you know cheers for going over that what wetsuit are you wearing pete wetsuit i have a living on the south coast of new south wales it gets pretty cold but big guy like me i don't feel the cold so i'm just in a three mil picasso top and a two mil um bottoms you're nothing like toothpick turbo then are you he, he's bloody he's flat out wearing a five mil all year the poor little guy 
in the tropics, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, that's pretty cool. All right, what other gears well, sort like of? big guy bonding or something. <laughs> like, like, well, we had right. Coatsman on too long ago too. He's a big unit as well, so it's, it's good. Um, so what, what's, what's some of your other memorable kit, Pete? Uh, floats. Um, just I have two hard bullet foam filled floats. So just two of them is plenty. And sorry to interrupt you, Pete. We just got new chairs for the studio, and you might have heard a cracking noise. That is Shrek. He's just broken his studio chair. It is brand new, and he's just he's absolutely destroyed the thing. The back's gone. <laughs> hey. Oh, my God, you're a mess. Get out. They make it for toothpicks, these things. And this is um, why we can't have him on boats. This is just, It breaks everything. Can't have Whoa. nice things. That, look around this guy. Oh, touchy subject. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, Pete, go on. Um, yeah, so I just have two of them. Um, plus, with my guns, I have a gun that has a reel on it, so that has 50 metres, so that's perfectly fine um especially for like just around reef and all that i have a flasher as i just said i have two custom made guns gloves i'm just wearing the adreno gloves the same as the booties the adreno booties and for a knife i have the rife terminator nice yeah good knife sounds like a good good dive bag pete um so it sounds quite well suited to shore diving as well particularly with the composite fins and you've got a fairly robust suit there and, 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 and gloves and booties that do the job, so good stuff. Um, all right, what's your fast five facts for noobs? So if you were starting out all over again, Pete, what five pieces of advice would have helped you out the most? Probably don't do the she'll be right. Just don't go down and look at where you're diving and go, oh, yeah, she'll be right, and just jump in and have uh, hands be sticking at your leg. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, so don't do this. You'll be right. Number two. Always have a dive buddy that is better than you. So if something really serious happens, like a blackout or a sandbar, you confidently know that that your dive buddy can get you. Cool. Because I've like there's stories out there of people like shooting their buddies so they can um get them back up yep um yep cool number three number three would probably be taste the fish for yourself don't let other people tell you what the best fish is yeah down here we have um a fish called the rock cod and so many people hate it because it's spiny as hell. Yep. So that's a good one. Num- number four? Not every fish is going to act the same. So your big pelagics, like say your marlin, isn't going to act the same as your reef fish like your blackfish. Yep. That's a good one. No, no one, so no one understand your fish species. Yep. yep. From. All right. Number five, Pete? Um, number five is probably just have fun. You're not out there to be the best of the best. That's awesome. Fast five, Pete. Shrek so- lives by that. He knows <laughs> he's not going to be the best, even on our boat. So just he just has fun. Hey, buddy. <laughs> I try to. Otherwise I, don't, otherwise, otherwise, I don't go out with people. <laughs> oh, cry me a river. Right. Number, so your fast five facts, Pete, just to sum it up. Um, don't do the she'll be right attitude. Number two was always have a good buddy, preferably someone who's better than you. As a dummy spin. <laughs> Number three, don't rely on other people's taste buds. Um, have a go at eating things for yourself. Number four, learn your species because they all behave differently. And number five was just have fun, um, especially when you've you know got mates like Turbo. Oh, never, come on. Just never stop you having fun. Hug. We need to have a hug. So that's pretty cool, buddy. Um, that's awesome. So... If you're going to give our audience sort of like, or other guys like yourself, Pete, that are just starting out, younger teenage guys, what what would be your advice to them? Find someone who is into the sport. All the six years I've been diving, it's only the last two years I've actually gotten a mentor. Half of my diving techniques um, to bring fish in, um, he's taught me. All right. And obviously, tune into the New Sparrow podcast. Yep. 
<laughs> he sounded so was, convinced. I was chucked yeah. 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 Listen that. to it every time, every day you wake up and every night you go to bed. Oh, good oh, stuff. Beautiful, mate. All Love right. it. It's been really good to have you on the show, um, Pete, and uh, we've been chatting with you for a while and you've been following the show, so thanks for um, sharing that around and it's really good to talk to one of our listeners. Yeah, no worries. Cheers. Thanks, Pete. Hey guys, quick bolt on to today's interview with Pete Morris. We've been wanting to record 10 tips to become a better Spiro for a while now. In fact, we've been promising it to guys that sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, but as usual, uh, you know, turbo overpromised and underdelivered. Yeah, no, my apologies, guys. I'm, I do most of the work here anyway, so it's just, <laughs> just on my list. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, so 10 tips to become a better Spiro in less than 10 minutes. Are you ready to go, Turbo? Let's do it. Right, here we go. Tip number one, do a freediving course. Yeah, that's very important. So a freediving course, you are going to learn how to breathe properly, how to breathe up properly. You're going to learn equalization techniques, finning technique, which is super important, streamlining. You're also going to learn rescue and safety and how to buddy up properly. And you're also going to learn how to increase your breath hold over time. All very important. And dive physiology is another great one you learn, which I found really interesting. Yeah, that full breath one was meant for me. It was the three stage, so stomach, chest, and then shoulders back and the top of your sort of neck area. That was really good. And uh, it's good for relaxation too, that four in, eight out, beautiful. Tip number two, join a club or community that helps you improve. Absolutely. A club or community is going to give you access to experienced divers in your local area, which will help you learn techniques and how to hunt in your area effectively. Not only that, you can often get discounts on training and um, things like that, and they also offer insurance as well, which is really good. So, um, yeah, no, there's a lot of benefits to joining a club <clears throat> or community. Yeah, cool. Tip number three, find a mentor and a buddy, which is pretty much a segue, straight segue from number two. Which- yeah, it is. Yeah, once again, it's going to help you progress by, you know, watching monkey see, monkey do. And the guy's going to be from your local area and they're going to know your conditions. And, I mean, you're just going to improve a whole lot quicker. I know I didn't have a mentor when I started and, um, and I'm a slow learner. So my yeah. learning curve was like really, really slowly. But since I've come on board, um, you, you know, you've you've come along in leaps and I bounce. can really smash a bag of Doritos on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, find a mentor and then you can replicate some of those good behaviours. And the other thing about a buddy is not just... Just um, having a good buddy, it's being a good buddy. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> Let's have a hug, buddy. <laughs> so, you know, and if you do become a good buddy, uh, look me up because my buddy, well, <clears throat> yeah. Tip number four, find a retailer you can trust. Yeah, super important. Now, a good retailer you can trust is going to save you money in the long run by selling you good quality equipment. And they're going to know what equipment to recommend for your area which is really important and you often aren't going to know that when you start. So those guys are usually all divers. Make sure they're divers and they dive your local area and just avoid fishing tackle shops with a spear gun in the back corner. Go to a dedicated free dive spear fishing store. Good call. Recently, I was in Adreno to do my roller conversion and uh, I got advice from three guys that have got, you know, wealth of knowledge. I had Wayne Judge, Trevor Kitchen and Taylor Slattery all giving me advice about, you know, from what to use to how to do it and everything. It was it was uh, easy. And uh, if you go to spearfishing.com.au, use Ooh. the code. <laughs> Keep going. You, you're committed. Use the code BoobSpear at checkout to save $20 on all purchases over 200 Tip Bargain. number five, f- serve out your 15-metre float line apprenticeship. Love it. We've all done it. So this is where you start. Okay, so your 15-metre float line apprenticeship. Bread and butter. It is. It consists of a gun, your 15 metres of float line, and a float with a flag. Now, this rig is super simple. It's great to use. It's for shore diving. It's when you start going offshore, the whole lot. The beauty of it is you got your, you're attached to your float. So if something goes pear shaped, you can take a rest on your float. Boats on the surface can see you. It's pretty much considered, you know, one of the safest ways to start diving. And, and you can shoot a fish and you can let your gun go and just, you know, bang, follow your float. Grab it, you're, you're all good top. again. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, cool. Tip number six, learn how to identify species and learn your local regulations. Right, so you need to know what to hunt and what you're hunting. Now, it's for a few reasons. One, you want to hunt something that's good eating, one that's legal to hunt, 
is another really good one. And you don't want to get sick from what you're shooting and eating, okay? So that's pretty important. <laughs> pretty uh, pretty apt too, considering it's coming from you. Yeah, I like it. So yeah, well, anyway. Now, the other reason, uh, another thing to learn are your regulations. You don't want to shoot something that's either undersized or prohibited species in your area. There's also closed seasons on certain fish, so you need to keep that in mind. And not only that, it's a really bad look for all of us in spearfishing when guys come back with undersized fish. Yeah. And uh, and prohibited species, so or, keep that in mind. Or shoot barramundis in hotel foyers. Exactly, as happened in Cairns. <laughs> Tip number seven, learn how to process and care for your catch. Absolutely. Shrek, you love your tucker. So you want to make the most out of your catch. So basically you've, you've got to learn how to kill it effectively, how to chill it, how to stow it, how to fill it, gut it, the yep. whole lot. From uh, paddock to plate, as I say, I don't know what we'd say in, the, in spear fishing, but yeah, the whole thing you're responsible for it, mm. and uh, and how good it goes uh, eating is really up to you. So you really yeah. need to learn how to process and uh, care for your catch. So look out for Turbo's article on caring for your catch. We've, we've, he's also written an article on a on a technique called Icky Jimmy, which mm. is about how to kill your fish really efficiently and effectively. Yeah. And it's some amazing benefits for the plate from that as well. So look at that. Go to noobspear.com. Tip number eight. Eight. Develop an environmentally aware mindset. Okay. As Spiros, we are custodians of the ocean and we need them to continue our sport. Regulations are great. The regulations set out by your local government are fantastic, but we need to develop our own sort of personal standards um, to adhere to. So that may be that you don't shoot a certain fish in a certain area or you move uh, areas and you don't take too many fish off the one bommy. These sort of things are kind of the behaviours that you see with guys that have been spearing for a long time. Mm, yeah, it just, it just means that your local reef or your local beach or area or whatever has fish next time you go out. Yep, and for our children and our children's oh, children. I think of the children. <laughs> so tip number nine, a good, a good accessible Spiro's knife. So like the reason you'd want an accessible knife is because you can get entangled. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Sometimes in your own float line when you shoot a big fish and you get wrapped up, yep. um, there's fishing line hanging off reef and logs and all sorts of stuff. You can get entangled quite easily. So it needs to be, you know, they call it within the triangle of access. So that means kind of like if your elbows are locked to the side of your body, can you still reach your knife? So it needs to be double bladed as well. And sometimes guys recommend having more than one dive knife. So that's tip number nine. Tip number 10, learn how weather conditions affect spearfishing in your local area. Yeah, okay, so... Yeah, the weather the weather controls everything, and you can't do a thing about it. So the tide, the wind, the current, the sea temps, the swell, the run runoff from rain, the season they all affect the dive conditions mm. in your area, and they'll either make for a good day's diving or a bad day's diving. Yeah. They, they don't just affect the visibility; it actually affects whether there's going to be fish in the area and what species of fish are going to be there. So that's really, really important thing to learn. Mm. And there's a few little things you can do there. Um, one, keep a log of your dives and the weather conditions leading up. Monitor your weather conditions leading up. There's great apps. There's a lot of weather apps out there. I mean, the one that we use is I, I use Seabreeze. That's super handy. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, that's definitely one to look out for. And I monitor the weather probably a week out before I go diving. Mm. Cool. And that's 10 tips to become a better Spiro with Shrek and Turbo in under 10 minutes. Get out there and become a better Spiro. So, guys, you can um, actually download this in PDF form. It'll be up when you sign on to our email newsletter, The Floater, where we send out heaps of funny and good stuff for Spiros. Plenty of good stuff in there. More shit than a show bag. <laughs> thanks for listening to today's show make sure to leave us a review on itunes or stitcher to learn more about becoming a better spiro visit us at noobspiro.com and subscribe to our newsletter